Today is Friday, May 23rd, 2014. And we're interviewing Henry Finkelstein at the Kings Bay Library. My name is Sharon Palmer, and I'm the Neighborhood Library Supervisor. And I'll be the interviewer. We're recording this conversation for the Public Library, Our Streets, Our Stories. Henry, thank you very much for taking the time to talk with me today. My pleasure. Okay, so tell me, Henry, where did you grow up? Well, I was uh, born in Linz, Austria. My parents are immigrants to this country. Uh, they survived the concentration camps of uh, World War II. Uh, the war ended in '45, so that's when they were released. They did not go back to... Uh, the land where they were born. They did not go back to Poland, but what they did was they went to a, a place called a Displaced uh, Persons Camp where refugees went uh, to wait and see what they were going to do. Uh, my parents had various options. Uh, the options that they had included going to Australia, going to Israel, and coming to the United States. They chose to come to the United States, but that was not their only option. Uh, in fact, most of my uh, parents' friends ended up in the Bronx. <laughs> my parents chose Brooklyn because they had family in Brooklyn. By the way, the person sitting next to me, which you can't see, is my wife Shirley. Uh, her parents are refugees also. They came to the United States, and they uh, went to the Bronx, uh, which, you know, I find um, quite compatible with going to Brooklyn. Brooklyn and the Bronx are pretty close, almost like Siamese twins, except for the uh, fact that Manhattan is in between them. So my parents came to Brooklyn. The first thing they did was we moved to a real tenement in uh, Bushwick, my memories of Bushwick are a little hazy, but I remember enough. I remember we we lived in it like a two, two or three floor walk up. Uh, it was a really old building. I know it was really old because the restrooms and the uh, and the bathtub and the sinks were all in the hall, one per hall. It was not, uh, I don't remember it being very comfortable, and I remember seeing bricks and stuff running all over the place. Uh, I also remember that the backyard uh, was filled with garbage. But I remember, you know, we lived on Bushwick Avenue. I remember it being a nice street. I remember a school several blocks down. I remember a, a car dealership being across the street. Well, I don't really remember it, but I remember seeing pictures of it. I remember my mother taking me to see the elevated train, which went down uh, uh, Broadway, Broadway, which was a block from Bushwick Avenue. And uh, my mother was always saying that I would demand to stay there for hours, or she says hours, just watching the trains go by. Uh, She's probably right. She also said I constantly pulled her hair. Uh, she's probably right with that. That probably ceased when my brother came along. He's about three years younger than me. And uh, I remember it being there. I don't remember it being a particularly good area. And I, you know, I remember having some uh, altercations, altercations with uh, some of the neighborhood, uh, you know, hooligans. Yeah even though I was only four years old. I almost got into a very bad automobile accident when I got into some kind of fight and I ran across the street because my mother was across the street. And uh, Well, my parents moved soon after that. The thing I remember most about Bush was um, Mellow Rolls. Does anybody here remember Mellow Rolls? No, it was a kind of ice cream cone, uh, which was kind of unique to the time. I remember watching Rudy Kazuti on TV. I remember watching uh, Kate Smith. I remember seeing Hoagy Carmichael, Robert Trout, John Cameron Swayze. No, none of this means anything to anybody except me anymore. Uh, and uh, I remember being there, and I was just about ready to go to school when this incident happened. Uh, 
And I remember the school. It was a nice old school that you see in old movies, you know, those really old movies. And I remember we were supposed to move. And then we moved one day. We just moved, me, my brother, and we just moved. It, we moved to this nice neighborhood in Borough Park. Uh, Borough Park was much different than, than it is now. Borough, uh, Borough Park at that time was uh, working class, lower middle class, multi, multi-ethnic area. It was about 40% Jewish, 40% Italian, maybe 20% Irish. And it was a, we moved into a nice one floor walk up. We had a roof. My mother had a washing machine. We had a, we had a clothesline on the uh, on the uh, roof. And from the roof, you can sometimes go up and see fireworks from Coney Island, which wasn't too far. Watch the train go by. I like that. I always like watching trains. Um, and uh, I had lots of friends in the neighborhood. Oh, yeah, in Bushwick. There was another thing I remember about Bushwick, which I still remember. Uh, I don't remember the person's name, but there's this beautiful little girl with long pigtails. And she had a grandfather. The grandfather was old with a yarmulke and a beard. And uh, I used to play a lot with her. I don't remember her name. I still remember her. And uh, I guess she was the only one I didn't get into fights with. Uh, I also uh, remember some of my mother's friends who continued to see her after we moved to Borough Park. One person's name was Fanny, and uh, her other friend was Mrs. Boynstein, which I thought was kind of interesting because I knew Bernstein's, but she was Boynstein. I don't know whether they were just people with bad accents or that was their real name. I have no idea. But uh, we, we kept that. She was always referred to as Miss Boyce. My mother used to have weird pronunciations of a lot of things. Like Woolworths was never Woolworths. Woolworths was the voice. My mother always said, we're going to the voice. Okay. I never knew. So, okay, we moved to Borough Park. Borough Park was a mixed neighborhood. It was a safe neighborhood. It was a quiet neighborhood. And it was a neighborhood that I felt comfortable in. There were a lot of friends there. And it was a neighborhood which practically everything we wanted was there. Shopping was there. If you want to do sophisticated shopping, we went to 13th Avenue, which is still pretty much the same. Uh, we went. We had the libraries. We had. Uh, we had playgrounds. We had plenty of schools. I went to one of them, of course. And uh, uh, if you had to go anywhere, we were near the uh, the train at. Uh, Day Hill Road, McDonald Avenue, something like that. And uh, we would go to the city if we had to. We, 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 we could take the train in one direction, go to Cody Island, we take the train in the other direction. We ended into, uh, you, we would go to Prospect Park. And um, if we wanted to, we, we would go to Abraham and Strauss. Everything. Delicatessens, Vuvois, or Woolworths. Woolworths was a great place. I mean, you go in there, they had everything. And they had the best ice cream sandwiches. God. You know. Most places have chocolate wafers. They had real crunchy wafers in ice cream. Needless to say, I really... What? Oh, we had movies. Of course, one of the movies closed down half the, half the, uh, the time I was there. Uh, it became a bowling alley. No, so a lousy bowling alley. Okay, let me give you a time frame. From 1949 to 1955, we lived in Bushwick. From 1955 to 61, we moved to uh, Borough Park. I went to a religious Jewish school. Some of my friends went to a religious Catholic school. Uh, I didn't know anybody who was a Protestant then. I never even knew of a Protestant. I think that they just said the exact were either Catholic or Jewish. That was it. Uh, and it was a nice neighborhood. It was a quiet neighborhood. It had everything we wanted to. And unlike children of today, my parents let me run crazy. They let me run everywhere. I would be in the center of maybe a uh, uh, an area that was, you know, had a radius of two miles. I could walk two miles in any direction. And I was used to walking. My parents didn't have a car. I walked most of the places. If not, uh, my parents would take me on a bus or a train. But it was, it was a great place. And I have lots of good memories of there. 
maybe because I was so safe and secure. And I saw things that just don't exist anymore. I remember trolleys. Not only do I remember trolleys, I remember what came right after trolleys. And it wasn't buses. It wasn't at least gas buses. It was electric buses. Electric buses were, uh, were wild. The nice thing about, the thing about uh, electric buses is trolleys were limited to the tracks. And you can get stuck because if the, something broke down in front of you, you couldn't go away. But electric buses had regular rubber tires. And if somebody was stuck to you, they would take the trolley thing, the, uh, the electric uh, thing, wire. That wire, and they would just hook it up to another wire. The, uh, you're not seeing my, me move my hands, but okay. I, I, the, the whole bus would move, and then it just, it was very easy. But trolleys were, were, were kind of special. I, I remember them, and they were, there weren't that many at that time, but there were a few. And uh, uh, not only did that, I saw horses. I saw horses on the streets. I'm probably going to be the last people to see working horses, because right now, if they were on the streets now, people would be saying how terrible it was. But they had children's rides that involved horses. They had fruit sellers, horses, people that collected garbage, horses, sharpened tools, horses. You have to be careful when you cross the street, but <laughs> there were horses all the time. And uh, I remember. Nobody's going to see that and... It was a good time, and my parents trusted me, and you know, to, uh, to be be safe as I go around. I only had one really bad experience. Uh, one day I was coming home from school. I must have been in uh, second or third grade, probably second, and I was supposed to bring my younger brother home with me. So one day I came home from school, and I, Richard wasn't there. Where's Richie? Where's Richie? I was looking for him like crazy. Couldn't find him. I, I, I knew about my home telephone number, but I tried calling and I only had a nickel. Nickel wasn't enough. I, I later find out that nickel was enough just before that. It just had changed to a dime fairly close to that time. So I'm going around and ah, wah, 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 wah. So I remember I was at, I think, Lenny's... Um, candy store, which was across the street from school. And uh, why I remember Lenny's, I have no idea. And um, I went in there, and, you know, they had those old boots, you know, big wooden um, telephone boots. I put the nickel in, didn't work, didn't work. Right. And then finally, you know, somebody saw me crying. You know, from over there, and they came and said, yeah, yeah. So I said, oh, said yeah. okay, give me a nickel. I called up. And I called up. And my mother and so I said, hello? I said, hello, oh, I said, hello, Richard, I lost Richard. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? I can't find him. My mother said to me, you stupid. Richie stayed home. He's sick. We're worried sick. Come home fast. <laughs> but now, now, you may think my mother is being unnecessarily cruel, but if you look at her, she'll say that my mother would have reacted, right? Right, yeah. And, uh... I remember for a good period, uh, my father was always around. For a while, he, lived, he worked very close to where I went to school. Another story I remember is once I went to school. And if you remember in those days, everybody, well, at least in my neighborhood, ate rye bread, unless you're Italian. Then you had Italian bread. We either went to the Jewish bakery or the Italian bakery. So my family had rye bread, and my mother would always recycle the bags. We, we, she didn't buy any bags to put on. She just recycled the bag. So one day I came in. I'm going into school, and then I wanted to see what I had for lunch. And I look in the, and there was a half a rye bread in the, in the bag. I said, "Oh my God, what am I going to do? I'm going to eat rye bread for lunch." <laughs> I said, "Oh my God." And, uh, and then a half hour later, my father comes traipsing in there. I don't know how he found my room or anything. He came in and he looked. The sheep is so, you know, like, what was he doing there? You know, he should be in work. My father was a, you know, uh, he, wor he worked with metal. And he came in there, and he looked, he says, 
I, I'm sure my mother called him up in the middle of work because he always left earlier than I did. He said, come over here, pick up the lunch, go to the house, take the bread, and bring the bread home. This is what me, she would, right? Yeah. So, so she went there, he said, gave me to exchange lunches, and I felt relieved. And, and, and then my friend next to me, Robert Prococo, hey, um, he, he was my best friend at that time. And um, he says, you know, I was wondering, you know, why did you have rye bread for lunch? <laughs> it was nice, close. Uh, it, was, it was a nice neighborhood, you know. We, we, I said, practically all my friends were either Jewish or Italian. I knew a few uh, Irish children, but they weren't uh, close friends. From what I heard since then, that uh, since the period of immigration, the earlier immigration, 1880s, 1890s, the Irish uh, came over earlier, and they tended to be separate, and the Jewish and the Italian people became closer. And that's the way it happened with me. So, what happened? What changed my beautiful life? What changed the way I was going? You know, I, I, it was really going to be good because uh, just before we moved, I was going to go into junior high school. And junior high school was only two blocks away. I was really looking forward to it. I'm going to go to a school that's only two blocks away. My grammar school was over six blocks away. To that, I said, gee whiz, I didn't sleep late. I'll be coming home. I'll watch TV. I'll, I'll, I'll eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and everything, and I'll have my friends and we'll play stickball, we'll play punchball, everything was going to be good. Then my parents came into money. It's not, it's, it's not important to, to explain what money they came into, but they came into money when I was in about fifth or sixth grade, and the first thing my mother wanted was a house. But not just any house, she wanted a ranch house. My mother did not want a house in which she'd have two floors to clean. She wanted a ranch house. So we ended up in Mill Basin. Not the center of the world. It was like far from the center. Nothing was there. No King's Plaza. There was a shopping center across the street. Eh. Uh, any place you had to go if you wanted to go to Flatbush Avenue. Uh. <laughs> but junior high school was three miles away. I was bust. <laughs> I was bust to Marine Park Junior High School. I hated it. I hated being so far away. I wasn't always the most friendly a person. If I'm not living with people, I'm, I, I never saw her. You know, I'd go to school, then come home, and there was nobody I knew there. Uh, I, I, it was extremely lonely, I thought. And, um, oh, I, I discovered Protestants then. Wow, new thing, Protestants, Lutherans, Presbyterians, Methodists, Wow. Where did these strange people come from? Protestants. And I, I then found out that they were the majority. They, they were the country. I never knew about that. It's amazing. When I was growing up in Bar Park, nobody ever mentioned Protestants. Ever. Ever. Well, oh, by the way, I had two brothers, not just one. But you have another brother, Norman. Okay. When they moved to Marine Park, they were young. So they went to the local grammar school. And by the time they got to junior high school, they built Roy H. Mann, which was in the neighborhood. So this is the new place. We, I, I developed a few friends uh, from my relationship in junior high school. Uh, there weren't too many playgrounds or anything in the area. They didn't come till area if I want till later. Uh, I did go to Marina Park uh, fairly often because I like to walk. So I would walk there. I'd meet people, play ball occasionally. I wasn't a great athlete, but uh, if you were uh, young and male, and uh, that's basically how you uh, socialize. You socialize through sports. Uh, I mean, real sports. When I was in uh, 
Borough Park, we played box baseball, we played scully, uh, we played, uh, hit the uh, hit the penny. I mean, uh, simple little games, uh, you know, which required a minimal a minimum of. Uh, uh, not enough space only, but uh, a minimum of uh, real athletic ability, <coughs> which I always had. I had the minimum of athletic ability. So I would uh, go over there and uh, yeah, occasionally. Uh, this was also the first time you know, I, I, I ever experienced any anti-Semitism. Uh, you know, I was beaten up a couple of times by these big uh, Protestants. Well, I get to know what the real world is like. Uh, uh, but, you know, they, they made pretty clear that they were beating me up because I was Jewish. When I was in, uh, well, we all have to face it. It's not, uh, you know, I, I got punched in the eye, pushed around a little bit. It's kind of funny because when I was in uh, in Borough Park, I never experienced any anti-Semitism. Uh, the Italians basically left us alone. Uh, I had some of my best friends were uh, Italian and all the really tough Italians to, uh, uh, it didn't bother us. The only people that really bothered me was bigger, older Jewish boys. Uh, sort of like Alan Dershowitz always talks about him being walking around Borough Park. Maybe he was one of them. Who knows? Uh, Alan Dershowitz, you know, going around with his big, fat garrison belt looking tough. Well, that was his persona. It wasn't mine. So here we are in uh, Marine Park. Marine Park was not a good place to grow up, but it had the best school. I, I'm still convinced. I was a lousy student. I had no self-motivation. I didn't care. I wanted to have fun. I wanted to play games. I wanted to watch TV. I did the absolute minimum of schoolwork, but I had the best teachers. The teachers I had at Marine Park were all, all first-rate even though they had me uh, as one of the third-rate students. I hung around with a lot of smart kids. Uh, they were brilliant. I was in the SP, which was special progress, which means I got to do uh, junior high school in two years instead of three, which is, you know, sort of balanced things out because I was sort of held back because, not because of my uh, ability, which would have been a good reason anyway, uh, I was held back because I was born January 2nd, and that pushed me into the next year. Uh, if I was born December 30th, that would have been the earlier year. But So I was pushed to next year, and uh, even though uh, I was a lousy student, I was a pretty good reader. I had good reading skills, and that came from two places. One, I spent a lot of time going to the library, and I read a lot of nonfiction. Some, some science fiction, but not live fiction. I did a lot of reading there, and I read a lot of comic books everywhere I went. So comic books and library, and I had good school, and I was told that I had the highest reading level in the school. Lousy in math, lousy in science, lousy in everything else, but I had a good reading level. So uh, for some reason they pushed me that, and because of my uh, being left back because of my age, they put me in... Uh, in uh, the SP, where, God, how, how I survived, I'll never know. I did well in some subjects, but, God, like French? Oh, yeah, yeah, I refused to, I, I, I absolutely refused to memorize. I refused to memorize vocabulary. And I have no vocabulary even now. Oué le chatot, all I remember. Quel oreille These things I remember, but that, that, that's it, you know. Uh, I was rotten in that. But, you know, I, I did do good in some science. I did well. So I, just, I remember something. Well, and uh, we went there, and uh, I had the best teachers. I learned a lot of stuff. One of the things I learned a lot about was history and government. I learned how New York City was run. I learned how the city was run. I learned words like comptroller, controller, zoning. I, 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 for, first of all, I, I just couldn't understand what, why zoning was so important. So zoning is important, determines land use. The only thing I knew zoning from was postal zones. I, I lived in Brooklyn, 15 New York. What does that mean? 
but they, 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 they cleared that up. And, and, I, and you know, I, I know more about government. I know more about world government from those days than I do now. I know everybody from those days. I, I, I know who the controller was. It was A.B. The, 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 the uh, mayor was uh, Wagner. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, Rockefeller it was the uh, governor. Uh, I remember all these things. Shanghai Shek. I remember Shanghai Shek. I remember Khrushchev, Macmillan. I remember all these people. Who, who are these leaders today? I have no idea. I, frankly, I don't care. But I, I knew it then. So I, I really mm-hmm. learned a lot. My teachers were really good. Every one of them. And that continued. Uh, it's kind of interesting because depending on the year you went, you lived in Mill Basin, you, you, it was determined where you went to high school. The year I graduated, we were sent to Madison. Makes a big difference because the year after that, they went to Sheepshead. At that time, the best schools in the area were Madison, Midwood, and Lincoln, Sheep said, nowhere near as good. I was lucky. I went to Madison. Madison teachers were as good, in some cases, better than uh, Marine Park Junior High School teachers. Top-notch. Top-notch in every respect. I did not have one mediocre teacher, let alone a bad teacher. All my teachers were good. All my teachers were better than good. They were all excellent. Yet I wasn't the greatest student, but I hung around with a lot of uh, some of the really brains of the school. Uh, and it was a good learning experience. That's why I find it so difficult uh, to accept, you know, the, you know, what you hear about these days about uh, uh, teachers and schools and stuff. My parents made pretty clear that any shortcomings that I had educational, ed- educationally, why educationally, any problems that I had, it was my fault. I was responsible. It was not my teachers. Um, and anything I did, they were, they, were, they were the best. Oh, another thing I can mention is uh, going back to Borough Park. Um, the first, uh, talking about libraries. We want to talk about libraries, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, when I first went to uh, uh, Borough Park, my father would take me to the library a lot. He would take me to the library a lot. Uh, the, the first book he ever took out for me I still remember it. Curious George and the Man in the Yellow Hat. I see it's still around. And there were other books uh, that I remember um, and my brother remembers and he's given it to his child over the years. And it was just a storefront. It was a storefront. You know, I don't know what it was before that, but it was a store. What I t- uh, they were very uncomfortable. It was hot and dark and everything. And then, 19, late 60, 1961, they built a new library on uh, Day Hill or not Day Hill Road. What, what's the name of the train station on the, on the, Day, on, uh, the F train? Fort Elton Parkway? No, no. It's the one right after 18th Avenue and before church. Didmus. Didmus, right. On Didmus Avenue. They, rem- they built a new library. Beautiful. New structure. Two or three floors. And it was amazing. You know why it was amazing? It was the first library in Brooklyn that was air-conditioned. <laughs> no, it doesn't mean anything now. And that day... It was everything, because no place was air-conditioned at that time. 
at that time, the, uh, the only place you wanted to go to where you can get cool was to go shopping for food and hanging out at the frozen food section <laughs> and picking up little cans. Well, you remember, I have small hands. Pick up little cans of frozen orange juice, six ounces, and holding them. <laughs> and staying cool over there. The movie theater I went to, usually, it was uh, the Windsor on 40th Street and 15th Avenue before it was turned into a, um, into a uh, bowling alley was not air-conditioned. It was comfortably cool. Do you know what comfortably cool is? No. Comfortably cool is that they had a big fan <laughs> and they put a big, big chunk of ice in front of it and it would drip and you would hear it and they would blow the, air, the, the fan over the ice and that would cool off the place. It wasn't bad. It was cool. It was damp, cold, damp air. It made my brother sick. He had all kinds of allergies and asthma and stuff. So he could never go to it, which way it was good because we went to the other movie theaters. That there was the Culver on, uh, on 18th Avenue, and then there was the Beverly on Church Avenue. So we went to there also. And once in a while, my father took me to the Kent on Coley Island Avenue. But... Uh, God, so, so when this library became air-conditioned, I used to spend a lot of time in the library anyway. Wow, what a pleasure. Today I would use the word machaya. It means, it's a Yiddish term, meaning, ah, that's, that's what it means. Uh, right? Yeah. So, uh, my parents never spoke to me in, in Yiddish, really. Uh, um, they wanted me to learn English. Uh, so, unlike a lot of my contemporaries uh, whose, whose parents spoke to them in Yiddish or even in Polish, my parents spoke to each other in these languages. But with me, they only spoke English. I think it improved their English also. But so every once in a while, uh, I, I pick up some uh, Polish expressions or Yiddish expressions. Most of them I can't repeat, but, uh, <laughs> but, but you know. That's it. So, uh, I was back in junior high school. I had the best teachers. Uh, in junior high school, I was a little isolated. I had some friends, but I really didn't feel like belong. This changed a bit when I became went to high school. In high school, I was just you know sort of pushing. You know, I wasn't doing very much, doing as little as I can. I was kind of disgruntled, and then and then. One of the people, one of the students who I remember, remembered from junior high school because he knew somebody that I knew and we always sat in the same table to eat lunch and we played the same table games. Uh, I remember him and then one day I was just sitting at lunch he says, Henry, do you like coming to lunch every day? And I'd say, not really. I'd eat the same sandwich and I'd be subjected to verbal abuse by the tough kids in the neighborhood, uh, you know, who always like to push over, push around the smaller, weaker guy. I wasn't that small, but they push around anyway who they thought was vulnerable. So he says, "How would you like to join the history club?" I said, "What the history club?" I says, "What do you do there?" He says, "Well, during the eighth period, instead of eating lunch, you come up there and you sit around, you talk, and you have a good time." in the lunchroom, you know, I was kind of looking over my shoulder and I joined the history club. I became, you know, very, very involved. We did lots of things with the history club. I represented the school. I wasn't a great student, but history, government, from junior high school, that I was good at. I, I went to uh, citywide uh, uh, conferences. I was talking about Africa. I was talking about Asia. I was talking about colonialism. I didn't really know the stuff. I made up half the stuff, but <laughs> nobody did. Know. I was <laughs> making stuff up. So I'm sitting there, and then all of a sudden, you know, I'm at this conference. I'm talking with people, and then the, the teacher that was in charge said, you know, 
one of you, I don't remember the exact word, he says, one of you has been chosen as being the most influential, most important, the person that contributed the most. And it was me. And I got this book, nice, nice book, which I used later for a book report, uh, called From Empire to Nation, you know, History of Colonialism in, uh, in, in Africa. Wow, I won the book. And I had a couple of uh, the people from the history club there. And then I said, wow, i got to go up back and tell everybody. So the next day we're at the class, you know, I'm going up and saying, hey, I won the book. And I'm like, hey, so what? Three of the people of our, <laughs> from our history club in different rooms won the book. Four of us came back with the book. <laughs> our history club. And, you know, uh, was it Mark? Oh, yeah, it was Mark William Phil. He's the one that got me in there. Not only did that, next month, my name is in the newspaper. My name is in the newspaper with the other people, Jan Brown, uh, Mark Williamfeld. Uh, we all went to separate places. We, he put all our names in thing. We won the book. Hear me. Mediocre student at Madison representing his book. And we did other things. We, we had a, um, uh, 1965, year uh, Lin, uh, Lindsay ran for uh, mayor. We had representatives come to our school to speak on why they're running for mayor. We had congressmen come to our uh, school. We had, an, uh, we had a citywide conference on, on history clubs and current events clubs. Uh, I, I went to Brooklyn College for a model congress where I represented, uh, I was put in a committee. I was a Ways and Means Committee. And I drafted legislation, tried to get it passed. After that, we went to a lower, the lo a state, uh, not a state conference, but it was a lower state. I went to New Rochelle. I was out of the state without my parents. Wow, this was something new. I've been to the Catskills before that, but not much else. And there I was, living in somebody else's house for three days, drafting legislation. And me, me, someone who, you know, was a really rotten student, except in history. I wasn't bad in biology. I was okay in English. So, so all of a sudden I had a place. And from there, after being in the history room, I got a job uh, working in the history book room. History book room, I showed movies. I made copies. I did lots of stuff, which was very important because... Learning how to use audiovisual equipment, when I went to college, I got a job there, and that job paid money. It wasn't volunteer. I got paid a dollar and a quarter an hour. Wow, what you could do with a dollar and a quarter an hour. I didn't have to go begging for my mother or my father for money. I got paid. Actually, when I was in high school, I got a job also uh, delivering uh, court papers. Uh, I worked there for a few months. I earned a little money there also. So, a nobody becomes somebody. Oh, we also had a, uh, another thing we did in, uh, in, uh, in high school. We had a, our own takeoff of College Bowl. It was the History Bowl. And we organized every class in the school to take part in the history bowl. I wrote a lot of the questions. Oops, sorry. I, I, I wrote all a lot of the questions and you know based on history and we had the uh, the classes come down to our and then we rounded it up until we had one class on um, uh, 12th grade, uh, one class in the 11th grade versus one class in the 10th grade. And that was the final and uh, I remember I was in 11th grade, and uh, people came up and said, Henry, are you, you going to represent our class? Now, they knew I wasn't a good student, but they knew I was good in history. They said, are you going to be in the I wrote most of the questions. I can't uh, do that. <laughs> my, my, my favorite question was, and this is the one I still remember. There were a lot of really dumb questions, but this is my favorite one. It says, who was Abraham Lincoln's first vice president? Nobody remembers this. Hannibal Hamlin. Hannibal Hamlin was Lincoln's first vice president. Okay, so 
I probably have other unimportant. So there I was in, um, and they were asking me, and I said no. But I was on stage, you know. And uh, the, the one joy that I had was my grade one. The 11th grade that year was brilliant. Not because I was in it. They were brilliant despite me, but we were brilliant. And uh, the next year, we were brilliant. We were the grades that really messed up college uh, the, the following four or five years with the Vietnam War and protest. And, ah, but... Despite everything I had in high school, I wanted to get out. I was having too much problems with my parents. Uh, you may have guessed, my parents were very overbearing. Uh, uh, they tried to control my life. Uh, it's one the thing about you know growing up with immigrant parents. You want to divorce yourself from that kind of lifestyle as quickly and as fast as possible. You wanted to be American. You wanted an American outlook. You wanted an American uh, way of thinking. You wanted to be American. And the thing about being an American is being an individual. My parents were European. Everything was family to them. Family you know, controls everything. Children, everybody contributed to the family, and that's it. So I went out of town. Uh, uh, I, I wasn't a very, it was a tough year to get into college that year, and uh, I would have had a tough time getting into any of the city colleges. I didn't want to. I didn't make any of them except uh, the community colleges, which probably would have been good anyway. And uh, I went upstate to New Paltz, which is a whole other story. I spent four years in uh, New Paltz, four and a half years, I went an extra half year to avoid the draft. Uh, and then I lived in Brooklyn most of my life. Uh, I spent one year in Israel, and I've lived in numerous, numerous areas of Brooklyn. I went to work in many places. Uh, I, I, I worked as far as, you know, I went back to Bushwick. I lived, uh, I worked near Bushwick. I worked in uh, Crown Heights. I worked at Bedford Stuyvesant. I lived in uh, Brooklyn Heights. I, did, I worked in Park Slope. So I have a really good uh, history and knowledge of Brooklyn. And I've always been happy to live here. I'm always uh, amazed at how the areas change tremendously. Every area you go to changes like every 20 or 30 years. Uh, you go back to Borough Park. It's not the Borough Park of my youth. Uh, you go to uh, not Madison, which is the area between Sheepshead Bay and uh, Marine Park, uh, where my high school is. It's named after me, so it's not really a formal area. And the area is just completely different. I remember where the movie theaters were. I remember where the bowling alley was. I remember where the pool hall was. I remember where the numerous bar and grills were. Bar and grills, you don't hear that term anymore. Bar and grill means that they had to serve food. You couldn't have just saloons. Saloons just served drinks, but they were outward, I found that. And, and, and the area was, like, predominantly Irish. You move a little bit, and it was, you know, uh, Jewish. You have first generation, and you have a second generation. Uh, I, I find out later... Uh, but it was mo mo mostly all, you know, middle class, working class. And it just changes. It just keeps changing and changing. Coney Island changes. Uh, Brighton Beach changes. And you see it. And um, I could go on. I don't know how much more you want me to talk about. If you have any questions, I uh, otherwise I you'll just get... question. How did your experiences growing up in the neighborhood affect your life? How did my experiences grow effective? You know, it's, it's kind of like saying, you know, what would have happened to you if you, uh, if, you, if you weren't shot in the leg and you grew up with one leg? I don't really know. I just know that, you know, growing up in Brooklyn, I did meet lots of different people. Uh, it never was totally homogeneous. 
Uh, most of my friends growing up uh, initially were Jewish and Italian, and then most of my friends became mostly Jewish, even though I always knew uh, people of different ethnic backgrounds. They were there. One thing I always remember, and, and I'm grateful to my parents, which I know a lot of parents just can't avoid, you know, cannot avoid, you know, bringing racism into their household. My parents were amazingly tolerant of all kinds of people. They sort of, I, I, I grew up with very little hatred and bigotry that I see a lot of people growing up with. I mean, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I remember times when people would say a word and I just wouldn't understand what it meant. And then it wasn't until later, you know, I figured out. I remember uh, I was once uh, in, in a playground. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just, you know, the playground. I mean, and then a guy could, would uh, come up to me and says, hey, did you see the, uh, I, I hope you don't mind if I use the term. This is what was said to me. Uh, they said, did you see the nigger in the, in, in the bathroom? I said, what? He said, and they repeated it, and I had no idea what they, went in, what they were talking about. So I, they said, you got to go in and look. I didn't know it was animal, mineral, vegetable, anything. I had no idea. My parents never experienced it. I was the first time. It must have been about eight or nine years old. So I went in there, and I see this poor, old, unfortunate, maybe drunk, down and out, you know, African-American, you know, sort of stooped over the toilet, and being in a very unfortunate, I said, gee, that's terrible. And I went out. And I remember uh, another time that I was at a house of somebody else's, and the person just kept using the term, using the term, using the term. And I just wouldn't understand it. And it wasn't just with black people. I remember in, in junior high school, where uh, where uh, somebody was telling me um, a rather um, a rather nasty joke, in which uh, the punchline was uh, the term "wop." You know, I had no idea what it was. And, they, and when they asked me to repeat the uh, the punchline, I not only didn't know, I couldn't remember it. They said, so, so, and I said, and said, no, that's not it. That's it. And, and I just said, I never experienced that. I, I'm not free of all racism. Or, I'm a totally perfect person. You know, I just did not grow up with it. You know, a, a lot of my friends' uh, parents would use the word schwarze. My parents never used it. Never, ever, ever used it. Ever. And I, as you know, going over through the years, I had different friends and different nationalities. And I don't keep friends that long, that often, but they came through my life. When you're at work, you develop friends and you meet a lot of different people. Uh, I was, you know, expecting that, you know, expecting different people, and uh, I, I think that's the thing I, I remember most about my parents. My parents, you know, d despite be growing up under very difficult circumstances, being Jewish in Poland and going through the Holocaust and then going to displaced camp and then coming into the United States, if I remember correctly, our original homes in uh, Bushwick, there might have been a large Hispanic community. I don't remember a lot of African Americans, but there might have been more Hispanic. Everything that, what? Parents never ever referred to Hispanics. It was not like a, we did not have a West Side Story uh, uh, mindset. Did I answer your question? Yes. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Anything else? I can, I can go to you about my civil service record. Would you say the neighborhoods have changed for the better or the worse? Gosh, it's 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 different. I'm different. Uh, you know, there's certain things I like. Uh, I like you know where you know uh, like you go down on Avenue U. I mean, wow, it's it's different. There is. 
Hispanics, there's Orthodox Jewish, there's Chinese, uh, uh, there's, there's a whole lot of groups of people. And you just walk down the street and you're just engulfed by that. And then you go back to to my old neighborhood where we moved in uh, Marie, um, in Mill Basin, and just off Mill Basin, you walk between on uh, Evan from Elendis to uh, which is on uh, Mill Avenue, Ralph Avenue, and then you walk to uh, 50th Street, which is uh, Utica Avenue. Looks like it hardly changed in 50 years. I think it's probably better for everybody the way that things are changing. But it's not going to stay the same. Today it's one thing. I mean, you go, uh, I mean, when we came into the house, it was uh, into our present house, uh, right over here, right here, uh, not too far from the uh, Kings Bay Jewish Center, Y, uh, y uh, to, uh, on uh, Brown Street. It was almost all Jewish, right? When we moved in. Uh, Blanche and Charlie, Charlie's. Uh, yeah, it was a mixture. It was a mixture. Italian but now... Italians. Yeah. But now, you know, you'll see uh, Asians. There are times when Russians are there. Uh, you see a whole uh, mix of people. That's probably better. I like, uh, I like mixtures. Uh, one of the things I like about uh, going around Brooklyn, and uh, there were periods, you know, when I used to give walking tours through the area. And like I said, I've lived, worked, went to school, you know, many different places. And I can give walking tours like that. And you just go from one neighbor to another, and it's different. And I think the change is, is different. I mean, you know, I was just talking to our, uh, my, my mother-in-law's uh, caretaker. She has Alzheimer's disease, so she has a caretaker. And she says she's going back to the islands, you know, for some kind of personal business. And I said, you don't have to go that far. You just go over to Church Avenue. Uh, <laughs> uh, you take the, uh, uh, the Q train or the B train. You go over there, and you go there. You hear the music. You see the people. You get the vitality. You, 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 you buy the food. See, I mean, you just walk around. I said, oh, yeah, there you are. You're in the island. You don't have to go. And if it's in the middle of uh, August, uh, um, and it's hot, and it's sticky, and it's... Uh, I say, you got the weather too, so you don't ever have to leave. You just go right over there, and uh, you're in the islands. And, um, and, uh, and when you combine that with a trip to, uh, what would you call that place, uh, Buckingham Road? What, the neighborhood? Yeah. Oh, Dimmis Park. Really. Dimmis Park or, yeah. or, or, or Prospect Park South. You go over there, and you've got two different worlds. you get two completely different areas, and you cannot believe that those areas are right next to each other. You can hardly hear the noise. I mean, you go one place, quiet, sleepy. Uh, what's, the, what's the term that they always use uh, uh, for, for quiet? Uh, sounds like a disease. <laughs> anyway, so, and you go, and I give walking tours there. There's Erasmus High School, and there's the old uh, Flatbush. Yeah. Anyway, I remember that area good, uh, too, because it always used to be where all the movie theaters used to go. Uh, Lowe's, Astor. Yeah. Any more questions? I'm, I got time. Uh, what? Did you enjoy going to the movies? <laughs> did I enjoy going to the movies? It was an experience. First of all, in the summer, comfortably cool was better than really hot. So you go over there, and then it was a wonder. I'm used to watching TV, black and white, screen barely this big, and then all of a sudden you go into the theater. You pay your quarter and you go in. The first thing they do is they herd you together. We had a matron who says, you can't sit there, you can't sit there. They put us in a corner. The matron was sort of like this rather old, grumpy uh, woman with a big flashlight pointing you over there, and you sat there, and you couldn't talk. You couldn't, you just, they were going to throw you out, but you saw a screen. If you're lucky, when you went with your parents, you went up into the balcony. My parents would take me up to the balcony, so you got the room. But you, you would stay over there, and the screen was huge. And I mean huge. It was wall to wall. This was before the days of triplexes and sexplexes and pentplexes, whatever you want to. There was one 
theater. So even a small theater, once it was a small theater, it was huge, stories high. The screen was unbelievable, and it was in color, black and white. So when I'm watching at home, so I see Sid Caesar, I see Burns and Allen, and some of the other, Kate Smith, I was telling you about Hoagie Carmichael, Robert Trout, John Swayze, Art Linkletter. I remember I see a lot of little screens. When you saw this big, huge color screen, and you, the cold, damp air was just <laughs> blowing on you. This was an experience. And then, sometimes my mother gave me a little extra money. No money, you buy a, a, a drink, a nickel. They had a little dispensing machine. This window was a small theater, so they had dispensing machines. You put in a nickel, you put it in, you press the button, orange soda. And you see the coat thing? Sometimes, you know, the, the, the unfortunate happened. You know what the unfortunate it is? The, the cup didn't come out or it came out wrong, and then the whole thing was just spilling out. Uh, <laughs> terrible, terrible. <laughs> they, they also had candies, uh, you know, so typical Hershey bars. Milk duds, yeah, something like that. And they also had popcorn. For Ten cents, you got popcorn. They had a popcorn machine. You put in the uh, the uh, the bag, and popcorn would come in. This is good because they it wasn't an automatic dispensing bag. You had to take the bag and put it in there. So you put the bag in before you put in the dime. Popcorn was a dime, and wow, that was amazing. And the theater Saturdays were a special day. We went to the Culver Movie Theater, and they'd have 25 color cartoons before the movie. And I remember <laughs> one specifically, and they had every really pretty bad. They, they, they'd have Popeye, Betty Boop, um, uh, Little Lulu, uh, Casper the Friendly Ghost. I don't know why we like Casper the Friendly Ghost. It was a really bad cartoon, but we, we used to watch it. And then... One day, right after that, they had the Three Musketeers. The movie? Yes. The good one, or at least. I always thought it had Gene Kelly in it. Lana Turner. Uh, Van Heflin. Wow. Gene Kelly running up and down. Yeah, well, Gene Kelly's a great actor. But they, in, 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 in uh, the Three Musketeers, he was Titanian. Vincent Price was in, and he's running up and down and practically dancing, choreographed uh, sword play. Wow. I think I must have been in the, 30, in the theater like four hours. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I remember when I, when I went to see, uh, when Davy Crockett came to the movies, I saw Davy Crockett. Wow. Movies were special. Wow. And my parents would take me every once in a while. My father took me once in a while. We liked movies. Television was nothing. Now I feel the exact opposite. I, don't, I hardly go to movies. I don't see anything there that's really that good. You're sitting in small theaters. People are making noise. The movies aren't that good. I'd rather stay at home watching small TV. But now it's color. The sound is better. Again, am I answering your questions or yes, I'm just no, rambling? No, no, no. It's very interesting. Um, what message would you like to leave for future generations who will hear this interview? Well, what I want to do is, you know, recognize what you've got. Recognize what's around you. There are things now that you, that you may think is inconsequential, but, you know, you're going to miss them when they're gone. God, I miss Horn and Harder. <laughs> I really miss Horn and Harder. My, my parents hardly ever went to restaurants. Almost never. Occasionally we'd go in the neighborhood, we'd go to Edelman's, which moved to, with us to King's Highway, and now they're out of business. We used to go there, we'd have some hot dogs, we'd have a knish, and we were happy. We didn't start going to uh, uh, Chinese restaurants until much later. But kosher delicatessens they'd go to. But the only other place we'd go to was Hoard and Hard Art. And Hoard and Hard Art, the automat, was unbelievable. I mean, you see the money going around, and people putting 
quarters, well, no, it was nickels then, in, into slots, and doors would open, the coffee would be pouring. It was amazing. It was life, and uh, we would just go there, and uh, it, it, I, I, I had a favorite meal. Uh, they had a Salisbury steak, a little gravy on it, mashed potatoes with gravy, and, and cream spinach. God, that was food for the gods. <laughs> My parents were, were, were basically atheists, and they, I sort of most of the time was an atheist, even though I did have uh, little periods of religious uh, observation. Schooling. Yeah, well, yeah, a little some of schooling. But God, that was good. Just the order. And we, and we would go there, and then my parents started taking stuff out from the store and bringing it home, and that wasn't as good. And then when we moved to uh, uh, Mill Basin, there was a place called Dubrow's, which was sort of like the cafeteria. My parents loved it. I didn't particularly. The Salisbury steak was no good. Mashed potatoes was no good. So uh, that wasn't good. Oh, God, I missed that. Uh, uh, I remember, you know, uh, the things that I used to go, go, go to old Coney Island. Uh, I remember my parents used to take me to Brighton Beach, and we would just go under the boardwalk where it was nice and cool. Can't do that anymore. I remember the people that used to come through the beach bringing you all kinds of food. It was the good humor man. And the thing in Brighton Beach, the Good Humor Man had something that they didn't have any place else. Everybody place had uh, humorettes. Humorettes were sort of like uh, pop, not popsicles, uh, creamsicles. They were like creamsicles. They were sort of like uh, vanilla ice cream covered with some kind of fruit ice. Um, every place else you got orange humorettes. They were good. But uh, at Brighton Beach, they had raspberry humorettes. No place else. Then there were also the great knish places. Oh, did they have great knishes at Brighton Beach. Sometimes they'd bring it to you. Sometimes you went to the places uh, on, uh, what's the big avenue? Brighton Beach Avenue. Brighton Beach Avenue. Uh, Mrs. Stalls was there. God, that was good. I do miss other things besides food, but uh, this is the things I, re <laughs> I, re I, remember, I remember most. Uh, I remember hanging out with my friends. Just hanging out and drinking Coca-Colas and, and uh, potato chips. That was gourmet eating for me then when you're seven years old. I, 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 what I do remember most is, like, uh, like I said, even though I was a lousy student, the education I got then uh, was unbelievable. And it was more than just, you know, standard education. I learned an awful lot. I took shop courses. I learned about metal. I learned about wood. They made us take dancing. I learned about art. I, I had to take music classes. Uh, they even made us do cooking at, at, at times. Uh, as the standard education, they made me uh, learn a foreign language, which I was never, never good at. But it was an experience I probably had to have. I learned an awful lot. You can't take that for granted. And again, I'm going to talk about the libraries. The libraries were available. They were available all the time. I could go there on, not Sundays. Uh, maybe it was. It's possible. Yeah, it's possible. Because I remember when I was living in Mill Basin, uh, when I had nothing to do, I would walk to Grand, uh, Grand Army Plaza. People know, I would, and I'd walk even further than that. I, I at times would walk up to Corvettes. I, I, I where was Corvettes? Corvettes was near Abraham and Strauss in the downtown. Uh, I, I would just, I, I just like to walk, and, and I would go to the Grand Central, and that was a great library. I would go there and uh, read in the local libraries. They were always there, card, uh, Dewey Decimal System card catalog. I could still do that a lot easier than fiddling around with computers. But the libraries were always there. They always had books. And I always and I remember in those days, I, I had this urge. If I saw a movie, I would read the book. I would read the book by another author. So when I read Arrowsmith, I read, after that, I read El McGantry. I read, um, uh, what was it, some of his other books? Uh, Sinclair Lewis. I read a lot of Sinclair Lewis books. 
What? Babbitt, yes, yes. I read a lot of books. Uh, I even explored fiction. The library was there, you know, and I, and I would actually read them. I didn't always read comic books. Uh, I would read the books. Libraries are important. Schools are important. And uh, nowadays, you, you know, a lot of times with libraries not there. Like I said, I used to go any day of the week, even if I wanted to walk. Let me ask you, you said you walked from Mill Basin to the main library, Grand yeah. Army Plaza, by yourself, or...? Yes, I was telling you, I, by the time, this was about 50, when I was 15, mm -hmm. and I would walk down. It was very simple. Lived in Mill Basin, walked over to Avenue N, Avenue N took you right into Flatbush Avenue, walked straight down Flatbush Avenue, took you right to the library. I saw a lot of different neighborhoods. And uh, I was familiar with some of that because when we uh, when we lived in uh, Borough Park, we weren't too far from Flatbush area in the real commercial area. Uh, now Cortelieu, uh, Church, uh, Beverly, we would normally be in that area anyway. So I was familiar there. And then you would pass there, and, and you remember, I remember the restaurants. I remember the, the, there was Garfield's. Garfield's I remember, uh, which was a big uh, cafeteria on uh, Church Avenue. Uh, and I remember walking down uh, the junction at uh, Flatbush and Nostrand, and there was another junction at Atlantic Avenue in Flatbush, which I would go to, which had a place which had really great hot dogs. Uh, I remember there. Yeah. And eventually I worked there later on. And I, I like to walk. I still do. I don't drive. I don't have a driver's license. If I go anywhere, most of the places, I either take public transportation or I walk. And I walk a lot, right? Slower than I used to. Much slower. Aches and pain. But I do walk, and I feel fairly comfortable walking. I remember, you know, I, just to give you an idea of, of walking, when I first got my first, one of my first jobs in, um, in, in uh, Brooklyn, uh, they sent me, I was working for... Um, welfare, and uh, they sent me to uh, Crown Heights, Bedford Stuyvesant. So there I am walking, and I was dressed like a 1971, 1972 hippie. I had long hair, you know, jeans, you know, plaid shirt. I'm walking around, looking around, and I wasn't too unfamiliar with that because my father used to work very close there, and I worked with my father several summers and several, you know, I, I used to wait. So I didn't feel that uncomfortable. I was looking around, I was a little lost. I remember this uh, rather nice, elderly, African-American woman dressed very nicely, a little veil, a little hat, uh, you know, a, a dress, sensible shoes. Coming up to me, and he said, "Look, he said, are you are you lost?" And I say, "No, no." He says, yeah, "Do you need help?" I said, "No." And, goes, and then she says, "You know, uh, we're having a church meeting this Sunday. We'd like to have you." <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, it's not that I had anything, you know, I, that I had any reason not to go. I just wasn't particularly religious. As I told you, I'm not a particularly religious person. I have gone to you know African American churches since then. I enjoy them. Sometimes I go over there, you know, I'm just looking around. Uh, women would come up to me, other women says, we'd like you to join. They'd hug me, sometimes kiss me. Please come, please come. I said, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm with these people, I do walking tours. I appreciate this church, I like it. And it's, it's right next to, uh, it's uh, in Hanson Place. There's the church right next to uh, uh, the Williamsburg Savings Bank. <laughs> Gotta go in there. Sunday? Wow, beautiful church. You go inside, it's, it, it's a church that looks like an outdoor exterior on the interior. And a couple of times I've gone there, they had bake sales and stuff. And go in there. And I, I'm coming in, I'm near the last price. So I said, okay, I'll have a piece of case. Well, you can use another one. So they gave me two prices for the price of one. I didn't ask. And I go into church. Churches are a great place if you're doing walking tours. Churches are the best places. Uh, you're always felt welcome. You're always made to feel good, no matter what the group is. I mean, you go uh, Jewish, 
Catholic, Protestant, black, white. Yeah, it makes no difference. They, you go in the You go into business buildings. Uh, they don't like it when you're there. They kick you out many times. So I, I, I've developed a, a rather, you know, and I go in, and I know all the songs. I'm very into I'm American folk music, so you know, if they're going to sing this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Oh, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. So I can sing all these songs with them and um, just tap, you know, start tapping my feet, feeling the mood. That's the thing about going to churches, some of so especially, you know, the uh, African-American, uh, Protestant, you know, Holy Roller, his Baptist, you know, you just go and you just, you just feel the song. Every time, feel the spirit, in the heart I pray. Memory's going, but, you know, I still have the feeling. I keep forgetting the question. <laughs> what so, neighborhoods did you do the walking tours? In oh, I did walking tours all over. Every place I lived, every place I worked. I can go uh, in, in Flatbush, I can go into Park Slope, I can go uh, into, um, I've get done in Mill Basin, I've done in uh, Heights. Brooklyn Heights, uh, Fort Green. Fort Green. Um, I've done a lot, I can do Bushwick, I can do, uh, uh, I can, we did tour tours in uh, Bedford-Stuyvesant, right? Yeah, we, we did, I remember. Uh, just you and me? Yeah, just yeah, you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, like I said, uh, the islands in Brooklyn, I uh, do that. And I've done a lot of that. Uh, the trouble is my memory's gone, and I just don't remember the stuff I used to remember. Did you stop doing it? No, I stopped doing it because, well, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Uh, <laughs> uh, we, don't, we don't know. Uh, uh, one thing, you know, I, I can honestly say, I've always... Well, at least since, you know, I came back from college, I've always had a deep uh, pride of growing up and living in Brooklyn. And I'm not the only one. I've, I've, I've seen this time and time again. A lot of celebrities feel this way. A, a lot of people feel that Brooklyn is a special place. And I, I, I guess I am one of them. And I, I like it basically because through the years I've, I've met, met and I've dealt with a, a, a wide diversity of people. And I like that diversity. I, I, I work with people of, you know, very wide intellects or wide um, economic backgrounds, and I, and I've always, you know, absorbed it. And you know, if people ask me what am I, I, I would probably say I'm a Brooklyn Jewish American, in that order. I think you know my my uh, being. Uh, Growing up in Brooklyn probably had the biggest effect on me. Being Jewish would probably have the second effect, and being an American, the third. Uh, this is what made me what I am, living and growing up in Brooklyn. And uh, well, there were times I, uh, I, you know, I worked in Manhattan, not much. There were even times I wanted to live in Manhattan. I never did. I've always lived in Brooklyn, except for the years I was in school and for the one year I was in Israel. But even then, I was always, you know, being said, where are you from? I'm from Brooklyn. Okay, well, Henry, I want to thank you very much for this wonderful interview and for your time. It's certainly been a pleasure.